welcome to episode 5 of season 2 of the Ubuntu UK podcast. It's Monday 25th of May 2009 and I'm Laura. With me this week are Tony. Hello Laura. And what have you been up to this week? Oh, um, I've mostly been not on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Fighting with ADSL. Yeah, and, and failing. Um, and sort of looking for a new ISP, I think the time has come. That bad? Oh yes, yes. Well, since Tuesday, my ADSL connection has been syncing with the exchange, but no public IP address. And despite numerous phone calls and uh, support web ticket things, um, I've not had any joy with the connection. Tried two different routers and uh, the ISP don't seem to be doing that much about it. Got a text message this morning saying, we're going to put this on hold for 24 hours as we think it's an ongoing problem. Yes, it's an ongoing problem. It's been going on for a week. Um, and that means to me that it's a bank holiday and nobody is working. And so they can't do anything about it till tomorrow. So I'm annoyed. Interestingly, did you actually try using a static IP address? I, I get assigned a static IP address, but it's assigned remotely. So essentially it's a DHCP lease on the router. Um, and I just had enough. I had enough of disconnections. I was off for a month earlier this year, which you might remember me yep. tweeting desperately about. <laughs> and uh, it's just too much. I'm going to go somewhere else. Yes, yeah, so the fun part of the, this bank holiday weekend has been the first hour of the day where you spend the time talking to the Plusnet. Yeah, getting on the phone to them. And depending on who you get, you either get somebody who's grumpy or not. We have one guy who's really good and really helpful. Yeah. And other people who are a bit grumpy and uh, sort of a bit patronising, um, which I don't like. So, yeah, I'm going to move. Had enough. Good on you, Tony. Yeah, thanks, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so, Davey. Hello, hello, Laura. And what have you been doing? Well, you haven't caught me off guard this week. Um, <laughs> this week, uh, I've done a few things. I mean, uh, one of them, I uh, went to a cloud conference um, where, uh, where we talked about cloudy stuff. Was Michael uh, Fish there? No, Michael Fish wasn't, but you know, we called about we talked about Stratus and all and all the other types of Nimbus. Uh, no, no, no. Keep it going. Was, it was about the uh, about <laughs> it, it was about the um it was about the internet cloud where uh, well I'm sure we'll probably have a segment on in the future. But that that was quite interesting. Uh, I, I did a talk there about uh, eucalyptus. Oh, I heard about that. Yeah, you yeah. were supposed to be talking and, and apparently you were dressed in Ubuntu colours. I was not. You saw uh, Adrian Bridge you heard you spoke to Adrian Bridget, no doubt, because he, he come to the Ubuntu stand we had there hmm. and uh, it was good it was pleasant to see him but um no it was uh it, it was good and the, the talk seemed to go down quite well talking about eucalyptus what was that about eucalyptus it's uh it's basically a free software replacement or, or it works with uh amazon um amazon cloud amazon aws oh, okay. or, or ec2 i'm sure i'm sure most people have heard of that now mm-hmm. um where it's basically like a virtual server but you don't actually care about where, where the actual server is as such. All you do is you fire up an instance. And when with the commercial one, you pay for like um, the CPU, the, the disk and the balance. You, you pay basic pay as you use. But this is a free one. So basically an easy way to roll out a cloud um, in your own data center. That sounds like something we need to talk about in more depth at another time, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gladly. When I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> but as you are here now, Simon? I've had a fun week. A uh, fun couple of weeks, actually. Um, an update for Drupal came out so I've been having fun and games updating that um, that was fairly quick and easy although I did have some fun with Tar I need to talk to you about that later on um, what did it do? well no it worked it all worked fine which was great and it was actually pretty quick and slick um, but I got paths in my Tar ball and I didn't want paths in there and I couldn't work out how to not get paths. Oh, anyway, we could, we could we have did. a special segment talking about uh, yeah, yeah. tar switches and parameters. <laughs> yeah, we could do, when I'm not here. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Laura, what have you been doing, other than not being on the internet? Not being on the internet, I've been learning to crochet. Oh, wow, wow. And watching West Wing, a lot of West Wing. <laughs> okay. Do you know, I've been waiting for nearly five years for a crochet tank top. But because um, the lady making it for me doesn't know how to make sleeves. <laughs> so You don't need sleeves in a tank top. <laughs> well, exactly. That's why I'm wearing a tank top, not, not a, a cardigan or, or a jumper, you see. So, so yeah. I see. Right, that but that really sounds good. great. Okay. Yes. Well, I think if you're waiting for Laura to do it, it might be another five years. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, Alan isn't here. Yes. Well, not to say where he is. It's a, it's a state a very secret, secret <laughs> location. <laughs> 
Uh, but he's not at UDS though, and no. you'll notice that none of the rest of us are either. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, so when we <laughs> said we might have content from UDS in this episode, we're not going to have content from UDS in this episode. But we do have the sun that they've got in Barcelona. This is true. The weather's oh, oh, and we'll have an interview with uh, Daniel Holbeck. Who yes. is currently at UDS? So, he, so that come, that that sort of makes up for us. Yeah, but we recorded it last time. Shh. You don't they, need to tell them that. Don't they'll you? know because Alan's in in the interview. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it does show that we're ultra prepared. prepared. Well, maybe, yeah. maybe just for this episode, Alan might sort of come back from his secret location just to do that. Just interview. to do the interview. Yeah, that, do a far that, that figures. Yeah. Okay. What else have we got? News and events. Oh, we've got lots of events coming up, haven't we? Yeah, lots of events. We're going to cover the competition that we set uh, last time. And um, we've got a rather good competition this yeah, time. Yeah, a really Please good Please don't one. switch off um, if you're interested in Python. Yeah. And a little bit of Ecosphere. And your feedback. Loads of that. And we're going to start off talking about how free is free. How free should we be? About this free. About I think. this free. I, for the benefit of our listeners, I'm holding my hands apart, approximately a metre apart. Yeah, a metre. But not really. further. No, not much further than that. Let's get on with it. Quite, quite often when we're talking to people, uh, we get into a discussion about freedom. And I don't mean freedom as in our rights. I mean freedom as in our software and what we use. And something that does tend to come up is talking about the podcast and what we do. I mean, sometimes when we have interviews with guests, they say, oh, do you want to use Skype? Well, we don't use Skype. We, we've never used Skype for any other interviews. But something I did, we, we did want to talk about was um, what about the other free options? I mean, for example, mm-hmm. we use Twitter. And some of the other ones, some of the other things. We iTunes. Could, I, I, of course we use iTunes. We get quite a lot of down, downloads from iTunes. And we have so, an MP3 version of the podcast. Yeah, yeah. So, so, what, so what do you guys think of that? Uh, we've been out on the, uh, on the Twitter and the Identica. And uh, I think Laura's <laughs> got some, some feedback there. I do, but there's quite a lot. So has anybody in the room got a, any thoughts first? Well, I think the question for me is, is, should we be as free as we possibly can be? Or should we be trying to include as many people as possible? Because we, as soon as you don't have an MP3 version, you exclude a load of people who've got iPods. But are you excluding them? Yeah. Would would they find any? Would they find another means to get it? No, you exclude them. I don't think they go and get rid of their iPod just to listen to us. No, no. But they're I mean, not going to go and find a player just to play this strange version of an MP3 file. It would be interesting to find out where our listeners actually listen to the podcast. Do they listen to it on their computer? Or do they actually copy it to a, a, a device? And is that device OGG capable? Yeah, I guess if people... I mean, we have had some emails from people who use the OGG version and and have had perhaps some trouble with it in the past. So we know there are people who, who use the OGG versions to listen to. But we also know from the stats that the majority of people use iTunes to get the episode, <laughs> which must mean that they're running it on Windows or, or a Mac. And that's I, the majority... I would like, like to check them stats. Well, that's what... And Alan's not here to, to clarify it, but I'm pretty sure that that's what he said, was that you know, the majority of people are using, um, are using iTunes, which must be getting the high MP3 version. Well, OK, let's just define what we mean by free, then. Because we don't pay you anything for iTunes. So are we talking about freedom of the software and the fact that um, you, know, you can't get to the servers, you can't understand how the servers work, a bit like with Ubuntu One... You know, this is a, this is, I mean, it's a huge bag of worms. What's important? Is it important that we can know how the, the servers work or that we don't actually pay for the service of, for example, iTunes? Well, I guess for us, it's important that we don't pay for it because we're not yeah. a commercial uh, show and we haven't got a huge like bunch of money to back us up on, on sure. it. But aren't there free software things now that can interface with iTunes? Have some of the players not got integration with it? I thought I saw some of the uh, some blog posts about it. I might be wrong. Don't know. I should check into that. But it is a proprietary store, whichever way you look at it. Yeah, yeah, but is that such a bad thing, really? I mean, for example, I mean, there's been a lot of criticism over Launchpad for being closed source, which is soon to be opened. Mm. Um, but to the end to the end user, does it actually make that much difference? For example, Google search engine is closed source stuff, but it doesn't make it any less usable, and it's still free to use. So, I mean, from what I know about you guys, and you know, we're, we're, we're quite pragmatic here, and we, we, we seem to strive for freedom stuff, but we do, um, you know, we, we, do, we do sort of take the blow when we have to. Uh, well, we go, out of our, we go out of our way to have 
to use free software when we're making the show. Yeah, all you the know, production is on free software. Yeah, so it's either hardware based or it's it's on free software like Audacity or Ardor or whatever it is. And we go out of our way to use Ubuntu on our web server and and, and to, not use Skype and not use Skype when we're doing interviews and things. But then we're quite happy to go. Oh yeah, well let's use Twitter and well, let's use iTunes. It's kind of that division of um, client and web based stuff, isn't it? Really, it doesn't seem quite so serious when somebody else is hosting it. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, Identica's free software, uh, well, it's based on Laconica, which is free software. So anyone in this room can set up their own social network based on the Identica code source base. But I think I only know of one, possibly two people that have actually bothered to do that. And there's only the one or two people actually using the site. So in many ways, I mean, is it actually worth going to all that effort just to host your own social network that, to be fair, does interact with the other social networks? But it, it, I know it just seems potentially a bit. Extra. I mean, if you're adding nice features to it, then 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 yeah. But just for the run of the mill stuff, it, it, is it worth it? It seems like a lot of the core kind of Ubuntu people are using uh, Identica or both Twitter and Identica. Well, I think Identica. Uh, sorry, I think on Identica, uh, Ubuntu. Um, there, there's a notion of hashtags where you mm. can sort of uh, add tags to your uh, your updates. So you can spread it out to more people. And the majority of the tags do seem to be uh, Ubuntu-based. And then secondly, for, uh, the, the, the second one seems to be Crunchbang from when I looked last time, which was, which was quite surprising. Y- yeah, but uh, it seems to me that uh, the people who really care about freedom and care about the whole free software thing are going to use something like Identica over Twitter. Uh, and George Castro stopped using Twitter and just went solely with Identica because he wanted to go down the whole free software route. But that means that the people, the majority of the people who are using Identica are going to be the people who really care about freedom and therefore are only going to want to use the free software to get hold of the podcast and, and, and really care about that side of things. The majority, uh, the, uh, sorry, the other people who are using Twitter perhaps don't really care about the freedom of web services in that way. But you've got the whole first mover thing and that Twitter's got so many more people using it. Yeah, you know, people have got a life outside Ubuntu. That's why I use Twitter. I do many more um, things than you know use Ubuntu, so that's why I rarely use Identica. So if we're going to appeal to everybody, we have to use the like of iTunes and Twitter to you know be all inclusive and uh, reach a wider audience. And after all, that's what we're trying to do. One feature I really like about Identica is that uh, when someone sends you a message with your name in, uh, it sends you an email. I, I, I really like that. I hate that. Because <laughs> the trouble is with, with Twitter, when you're following, say, 50 or 100 or, or more people and they update quite regularly, it's very easy for you to just to miss their updates across the timeline. But if you use a decent client, actually, you can go and search for their updates to you specifically. Yeah, but you have to do it manually. They don't, they don't, they don't push to you. It's like the push-pull thing idea, isn't it? Okay, Simon was talking about inclusivity and therefore and saying we should be as inclusive as possible. Does that make us an advocacy tool then? Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah, definitely. Why else are we doing this? Well, we keep asking people ourselves in the beginning of every episode. <laughs> it is a damn fine question. Okay, well, the other option is that we are um, part of the community and we're, uh, we're a show for people within the Ubuntu community and that, therefore, we're servicing people who are already on the inside. And, and do we assume that? Because we're not, we don't do newbie sections particularly. We don't sit and explain sort of is it the ins and outs of, of, of how to get started with Ubuntu. We've never sat down and told people how to install Ubuntu, for example. We assume, I think, in some of the content that we that our listeners have got a reasonable amount of background knowledge about Ubuntu. Kind of similar to our own level. Yes, you say that, but the conference I, I, the, the, uh, I spoke at this week, um, it's rare for me to go to um, a geek event where the majority of people aren't Linux users of, of, of any flavour. Um, but the actually at least half the audience either weren't or had never used Linux uh, of, of any form. And so I had to actually explain the notion of like repositories and how to install and, you know, how it works differently to, say, Windows and Mac. And that was kind of an odd feeling to have an audience of, of people who don't really know the, even the, the base stuff about Ubuntu. OK. And if they listened to this show, would they get much out of it? Or would it be just too... Too assuming that... I don't think we can answer that. Uh, because we're too involved. It, only mm. people that listen to the show yeah, can tell you the answer to that. For me, it was a real realisation that there are people who know about computers who don't know about Ubuntu. That that was really weird for me. 
The dichotomy to me seems to be that if, if we're an advocacy tool, then we should strive for inclusivity and we should use the free and the non-free services. We should use Twitter and Identica side so, by side. Hang on, if I can just expand on what you're saying there. Okay. So you're saying that, that, that you that this is what I'm getting from what you're saying there. It's okay for us to use non-free services, providing we also offer the free service alternative as well. I think so. If we Well, if we want to be inclusive, yes. If we are perhaps servicing the freedom part of the Ubuntu community or the part of the, the Ubuntu community that really values freedom, then we should just be using the free stuff. And if that means that it's a higher barrier to entry, that doesn't matter because actually we're holding true to the ideals of Ubuntu, which is free software. I don't know. Ubuntu is about being pragmatic as well because it acknowledges that you can't get drivers for things, so it includes them even if they're proprietary drivers. And they encourage you not to use them and to use free ones, but they're pragmatic about it. I mean, that's one thing about Ubuntu that's meant it's been easier for people to adopt it. But pretty much every distro is pragmatic about it these days. Um, can, can you actually off. still play MP3s easily without having to hunt around on the net on Fedora, do you know? Because that was a big thing, for trying to play MP3s. It, it was. I, I thought they'd taken the uh, easy codec downloader thing into Fedora now. Oh, have they? I thought they had, yeah. Oh, okay. But I mean, the only real, the only distro that really totally strives for total freedom is um, GNU Sense. GNU Sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, we used to be Gobuntu, but I mean that 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 project yeah. pretty much got absolved. So pretty much every other distro then has got some non-free bits in it, and is therefore accepting some sort of you know tainted freedom until there is a perfect happy day when all the graphics drivers are totally f- free software. Well, and I mean, work. if we look at Debian, I mean the the way they work is they're also quite pragmatic. They everything has to go through the Debian free software guidelines. Mm. You might have seen it abbreviated as DFSG. So so for some things they they do rip out stuff which isn't free, but they they did like like let things through like wireless drivers and things like that. So I mean Debian is probably a, a good project to look at for trying to be really free mm. and then just letting a little bit through when you just need the extra functionality I suppose it's kind of it's quite similar to what we've been getting in response on Twitter and Identica um, Get on. The, the irony is that before we started this segment I said that normally when I Twitter or Identica uh, tweet or dent tweet or dent sorry um, during the podcast all my responses come from Twitter followers not from Identica ones and I think this time we've probably got half and half um, that's pretty good because we have three times as many followers on Twitter as we do on Identica. Yeah, possibly more in people interested in freedom on the Identica account. Mm. See, the, the problem is with the name is I really struggle to take it seriously when someone says, oh, I dented that the other day. <laughs> well, I, I tweeted that. Maybe yeah. you're just more used to tweeting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's getting more mainstream, but mm. dented. I don't know. I don't know. So what have they been saying? So we've got... Um, Various people saying don't use iTunes, but I think that's down to personal taste as much as anything. Are they saying they don't use iTunes or we shouldn't use we iTunes? We shouldn't use iTunes, okay. but when I replied, it's because they don't really like it as much as anything. Mm. Um, a lot of people saying inclusive, inclusivity. Um, one uh, Dave1022 says it'd be an effort to convert OG and then sync it back to my iPod. Yep. Um, Effort that people probably wouldn't go to. Certainly not absolutely. Not people couldn't stumble over it and do it, could they? There are not people who download the, this podcast on iTunes on Windows, and that's pretty much the only reason they still use Windows. Because then they do all their iPod syncing on Windows and then switch back. See, I mean, at the moment, we, we've, we've got some feedback there from the Identica and the Twitter. Uh, <laughs> but it would be rather interesting um, for people, because I imagine some of the downloaders and i'm i'm gonna um i'm gonna make my theory that some of the people that get our content from itunes are i suspect might be less likely to use twitter or identica so it would actually be kind of interesting so if you're getting us via itunes yeah let, let us know you know mm. whether we should keep doing it or not yeah and and why you use itunes as opposed to anything else that would be interesting to know and if you're using itunes is that because you use windows or is it just because that's the way that you get things downloaded but you use something like ubuntu or whatever the rest of the time and if you use itunes because it's syn- <laughs> and if you use itunes because it syncs with your ipod why do you use that as opposed to the ubuntu solutions if so, that's your case so that's a complete questionnaire to fill in yeah. and send it to you <laughs> and podcast. your age and your shoe size <laughs> <laughs> podcast at ubuntu-uk.org okay what else is on the twitter and the identica okay we've got um liam gh says the freedom bit is often overlooked as um, idealism, but it creates very real opportunities for skills development and innovation. I think lots of people agree with the idea of freedom. Lucy 
on Identica, I think it was, uh, made a point that you should use Twitter, etc., but only to introduce people to freedom. So tell them about Ubuntu, about Identica and data sharing issues. Um, because if you only use free services like Identica, you're only preaching to the converted and your message doesn't get very far. Yeah. Chuck says, as long as you don't provide something to the proprietary people that you deny to the freedom lovers, I think you're good. Oh. Well, technically we do, because the actual Flash player on our website, if you want to listen to it f- from the website, Live. that mm. is that that is actually streaming the MP3, MP3 source. Mm. Yeah, because the actual... And the old, Flash, the old one's Java and it doesn't work. Yeah, well, it does work, but it's, <laughs> it's pretty messy, to be honest. It was. I haven't tried recently, last, time reason, we, last time we tried to enable it, it hit the same file three times every second. Yeah, but also, we save it, um, it also really brought up the load on our server yeah. of just a couple of listeners. But the, the reason we do that is because Adobe Flash, or, or Flash in general, the actual uh, spec, doesn't support OG. It only supports MP3, so, mm. so we couldn't do it. The only way of doing it would be to actually stream the OG and then in software convert that. You know, it seems really messy. Well, yeah, but the point is that that's something we're not providing to the OG listeners. Yeah. The people who want to listen to OG. Although if they've got all the plugins, then it will play in their browser like a stream anyway. Mm. Okay, what else have we got? Uh, Mike Camel says inclusivity is good, but remember it's almost impossible for Linux folk to use iTunes. But then that, I guess, that comes back to the fact that we're not only releasing via iTunes, so mm. we're not preventing Linux people from downloading a Linux podcast. Well, I mean, yeah. some of our listeners that I've spoken to actually don't use Ubuntu at all. They've used and they've they've dabbled with it in the past. And they have an interest in it, but they don't actually run it. That's why it'd be interesting to see what the iTunes users use. Yeah. Why do you listen? <laughs> <laughs> CMSJ says that there's nothing wrong with posting an MP3 on iTunes as long as you're doing the OGS on the website. Mm-hmm. Um, combination of both, Squareliontis says. Mm. Um, it's pretty much the same thing from everybody. Okay, well, if you've got a point of view that we haven't covered in um, that little recap there, then send it into podcast at ubuntu-uk.org using the open standard smtp protocol um and uh, for, for you normal folk out there yeah just your email, email. <laughs> <laughs> um and we'll read it out on the next show Open source video and internet TV player Myro have launched a new Adopt a Line of Code initiative, which is uh, good fun. Um, you can adopt a line of code for $4 a month, and for that you get an official adoption page, a cute image of your line of code, and you can watch it grow over the year. Uh, badges for your blog or your website, and your name will be listed in the About box in every copy of Myro. Wow. See, do you actually get to pick your line? Because knowing my luck, I would get some rubbish comment or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Two tabs white space. So I would adopt white space. <laughs> a curly bracket. Yeah. yeah, if they do the formatting properly, there'll be lots of people with curly brackets. <laughs> See, I was going to sponsor an endangered penguin or something, but now I won't. I'll just go and uh, sponsor a line of code instead because they're clearly more endangered. It's quite cool. No one yeah. else has done it. That's and a there's a whole adoption centre. Really? There's a whole website that's an adoption centre and it's got cute little pictures of the lines of cord. I'm going to have to go have a look. <laughs> Sad. See, that, that's actually a really good present for someone, you know, you could put that for in For the there. right person. <laughs> Happy birthday, mum. I've yeah. got you. I've got you a semi-colon. If smokes a semi-bracket. <laughs> Former Microsoft developer Keith Curtis has written a book, After the Software Wars, in which he explains why he thinks free software will beat his former employer. Apparently it's quite interesting. He's a bit of a Linux convert now. Really? Yeah. I might have to read that. I'm not convinced, I have to say. In what See, way? In that um, I think we've got a lot to do to beat Microsoft. You know, we're all converted and we all understand, but you know, it's a, it's a big beast. And working with um, commercial companies and who deal with software, they really... It's not just Microsoft. It's the companies that work with computers just can't cope with not making money for and with software but i mean if you look at mac when they had their their huge um i mean they, they, they started doing it on power drive didn't they about well six seven years ago and they've actually got you know, quite a significant portion of the market now so i don't see, I don't see there's any reason we couldn't mac's quite pretty <laughs> Canonical have demonstrated applications designed for Google's Android platform running on their network remix, suggesting that applications designed for Google phones will run just as well on Ubuntu desktop.
That's quite cool. That was at um, not UDS, although I think it's being talked it was about the at UDS. Album just before UDS, but they are, they, are, they are discussing it this week as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean that opens up a whole range of non-free, admittedly, applications that could run on Ubuntu. I mean, there was a number of people that are identical and twitched it, and it's you know I felt a bit. It's not that exciting, is Don't it? Don't we already have the applications now? I mean, what's it going to bring? Or is it just... It'll be that, that beer one where you can drink the beer and it tips up and it goes <laughs> down as you're drinking it. That's really cool. <laughs> Dell have announced that their latest netbook offering, the Mini 10V, will run Ubuntu 804, not either of the newer versions. Dell say that the stability offered by the LTS release is more important to their customers than the bleeding edge features, although they have backported some of the 3G network manager work to their version of 804. Now, this raises the subject again about, um, you know, are we releasing too often? Is six months too often? No. That's That's, great. That's why you have an LTS release. And that's exactly why you have an LTS release, so that big people like that can say, that's what we're sticking with, and backport any Good call. Very good. Especially the 3G stuff. Um, That's the most important. The thing is, they're self-backporting it. It's not being backported by the Ubuntu project or Canonical. It's open source software, so they can do that. Yeah, but the thing is, I mean, we've actually got backporting repositories, so Mm -hmm. why isn't more software being backported to to LDS? Because it's a stable release. But then people clearly need the updated features. So they they should use a newer version. You tell them that, Tony. Go on. (laughs) Well, Dell seems to be coping just fine. Canonical have announced that version 1.3 of Landscape can now manage Ubuntu servers hosted on Amazon's EC2 cloud, allowing uh, users to start, stop, and manage their supported EC2 images. Yeah, this feeds into Dave's cloud, what he was talking about earlier. Is it just me, or did none of that make sense? Yeah, sorry, I fell asleep halfway through that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, okay, I mean, we, we had a um, we had a, an episode in, uh, about landscape, didn't we, where yes. you use that for managing your computers and servers, yeah. and particularly for managing lots of them. But again, this is another non-free service, and I actually, I really want to use landscape, but I want to use it hosted on my own servers. Unlucky. Sucks to be me. <laughs> <laughs> Wikimedia are moving Wikipedia and all their other projects away from the GNU free documentation license to a Creative Commons CC by SA one instead. So this yeah, means I read into this earlier on. Yeah, it took me a while to understand, you know, what the difference is because surely they're both about freedom. Yeah, well, but they're not compatible. Well, uh, the the actual GNU free software documentation license was actually designed for documentation that goes with software. It wasn't designed because mm. when they actually come up the project. They wanted something like the, uh, the one of the um, CC licenses, but it just wasn't available then. Yeah. So they wanted to change. And in order to change that, they had a huge vote. And I, there must have been thousands upon thousands of people that voted. If you contributed more than, say, five or ten articles or something like that, you know, you were entitled to a vote. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> I'm not being... But do, do actually a lot of people actually care about this as an issue? Some well, people it, do. Yeah, but it is an issue. Uh, I mean, let's just understand exactly what the issue is. Why couldn't they just stick with the um, free documentation license, the new one? Why couldn't they stick with that? It's got some non-free bits in it. Really? Yeah. From GNU? Yes. It's it's the uh, um, unchangeable parts. You can you can have parts of your documentation that you nominate as unchangeable uh, using the free documentation license. And that's non-free. And not really conducive is, to Wikimedia. No, exactly. And that's, well, not that you have to use that part, but that's the whole point of the, well, part of the license is you can have bits which you say are non-changeable and therefore are, are, are non-free under in, in terms of a total freedom and total changeability aspect. So, so it's not entirely suited for the sort of content you get on Wikipedia. Well, so, so, so what does the CC by SA actually stand for? Yeah. Um, by is attribution, so you have to say where you got it from, and SA is share alike. So, so, so what does that actually mean? There's a really good definition on the CC on the. So it means you can take you can take some content and you can do what you like with it and release it back out to the community. The only thing is you have to say where you've got your source material from, so a link to the website, and you have to pass it on in the same way so other people can then take your work and and re- that one you can use commercially, it. can't you? Yes. And the one you can't has an NC. Has a yeah NC or ND. If uh, ND is no derivative, so that's that's a, a non-free. So you can share it, but you can't edit. Yeah. Uh, we've got lots of events that are coming up. A new conference for free software authors uh, writing open source is being held on the 12th to the 14th of June in Owen Sound, Canada, being run by uh, Emma Jane Hogbin, who we interviewed uh, earlier this season. Oh, was that the Drupal book? Yep. Yeah, that yes, Drupal okay. book that you and I both have. And I don't have one. Read. 
No, it's just you. Southeast okay. USA Linux Fest is on June the 13th in 2009. The first ever open video conference will take place on June the 19th to 20th in New York. Speakers include DVD John and hackers from Firefox, VLC, Miro, and many more. Euro of Python 2009 is running from Sunday 28th of June to Saturday 4th of July at the Conservatoire in Birmingham, United Kingdom. More details at europython.eu and listen out for a very special competition later in this show. Wow, June's I, busy for conferences and events by the sound of it. I think that's worth going just because I've never been to a conservatoire before. <laughs> <laughs> Open Source uh, Schools Unconference at uh, NCSL's Conference Centre in Nottingham is on uh, Monday the 20th of July. In three words, what's an unconference? It's a conference without a schedule. Okay. Software Freedom Day this year is in is uh, Saturday the 19th of September 2009, which is the same day, apparently, as Talk Like a Pirate Day, unfortunately. Oh, oh. good. And finally... Lug Radio Live 2009 will be on the 24th of October, New Hampton Arts Centre in Wolverhampton. For more information, check out lugradio.org slash live slash 2009. Or follow them on Twitter or Identica. With us here this evening is Daniel Holbach, who is one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse or something. Is that well, right, he's not, Daniel? He's not quite here. Exactly. <laughs> what do you do with Ubuntu? So I, I work for Canonical. I work for General Bacon. I'm part of the community team. And I take care of the Ubuntu development community. So I try to make, make it as easy as possible to, to get involved and... and um, try to look after the teams and everything, how they're doing. And um, yeah, it's a very interesting job. And um, in, in a lot of cases, I, I not only work with the development community, but also with the, with the local community, with the, the Buck Squad, and with, with all the other teams. So there's a lot of overlap. And the great thing about it is, is the enthusiastic community and all the people who, who, who join us. They're very enthusiastic and, and uh, want to improve Ubuntu. And, um, yeah, it's still the, the same spirit. When, when I joined the Ubuntu community, and I had a fantastic experience back then, and it's still my aim to, to let everybody else have the same experience. So is your work more with um, internal developer communities within the Ubuntu project, or do you do work with upstream and outside projects? So... Um, we also have um, George Castro in, in the community team, and he's he's taking care of the upstream relations or external right. relations. So um, he's he's in touch with with all the the major upstream projects that, that we work with. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, there's overlap for me as well. So yes. You, yes. you, you said you um, you like uh, you're enthusiastic, and you know that that shows. I mean, I've met you, and you are a very enthusiastic person, <laughs> and I know that rubs off on on other people. Um, do you find it um, that there's uh, when there's conflict in the community? Um, do you find it difficult, like keeping people enthusiastic about a product that comes out every six months, and there's so much to do all the time? Do you find do you find it difficult doing that? And how how do you how do you deal with that? At times, uh, people have different opinions, and you and you have conflict. I'm sure you you had your fair share of it in in, in the local council. I mean, yes. it happens from every now and then. But I found it pretty not pretty easy. But in a lot of cases, it's you can talk to people. You can try to bring them back to um, right. the, the spirit, the ideas, and and um, and what everybody's is after and and I think we we always came up with a with a good compromise whenever there was conflict. Right. But that's uh, something you have to deal with as part of your daily job and God. you know. Every, every now and then I'm 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 part of the community council as, as well. Every now and, now and then it it happens. Sometimes it's it's um, the people have different expectations or have wrong expectations of, around something. But in 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 the end we always come up with with a good compromise, and often it, it helps to just pick up the phone and and talk to people and and, and uh, let them hear your voice, and then you listen to them. That helps a lot, sure. especially if you have a long uh, mailing list discussion going on. 
<laughs> yeah, mailing lists and IRC are not usually the greatest medium for doing that kind of stuff. Exactly, yeah. exactly, yep. One of the things that you've done in the past is a series of, of videos telling people how to get involved with packaging. Um, there were video tutorials. Um, we've had some questions from our community members about packaging and, and packaging Ubuntu as well. Um, so we had, uh, we just wanted to put them to you if, if that's okay. Um, we had Matthew Wild asking about, he, he's got a package that's close to being included or sponsored into Debian. And mm -hmm. should he also submit it to the Ubuntu Motu people if he wants to see it in uh, Karmic? Sure. Um, so let's say it, it gets in, into Ubuntu first. For us, it's, it's very easy to say, um, okay, we, we prefer the, the, the version in, in Debian, and now we're just going to, we call it to, to sync a package. We're just going to um, pull the, the, the source package from Debian and just build it in the Ubuntu archive. That's easy enough for us, for us to do. We have that every now and then, that people submit it to, to Debian, and it gets included there first. It, it always depends a bit on where we are in, in, the, in the release cycle and uh, where, where Debian is in, in their release cycle. Of course, if just a few weeks before release, it doesn't make sense to, to start thinking about, about new packages. Mm, or, or yeah. we, we just try to fix all the bugs we can. But generally, you're happy for it to go, if, if it makes sense at, at the time, you're happy for it to be either first in Debian or first in Ubuntu. It doesn't really Absolutely. matter. Absolutely. I, I encourage people to to get their packages into into Debian and, and fix it into Debian, and we we improve that a lot. Right now, in, in the Motu community, there's there's a very strong spirit of did you give this back to Debian? Did you forward the patch and, and yeah. so on? I think we're do, doing a much better job than we than we did a few years back. So I'm I'm very happy with that. Cool. From uh, from Twitter, Dot Waffle has asked um, or said that packaging is known by most to be hard. What's going on to make it more um, approachable by the community wanting to help out? It's something I've um, I've said in the past as well, actually, that it um, just seems to be just far too difficult. So, uh, what are you going? What are you doing to to make it easier for people to start packaging? Ellen, what was your experience? <laughs> uh, it was Simon. <laughs> no, no, that was. I think oh, Danny oh, was really? asking me because I did a bit of packaging. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. Well. Yeah, well done, Daniel, for throwing that at me. Um, yeah, actually, it is, it's not that easy. I, th I think it's because it's quite fiddly. There's lots of little bits that make up how you do it. Is that, would that be fair? Absolutely, absolutely. And there's lots of documentation about it, but yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of yeah. documentation about it. So we, we, we tried to improve a, a number of things. The first one was documentation. It was, it was the, the first thing when I started working for, for Jono and on, on the community team was, was the first thing I, I looked after because, um, yeah, the documentation was just scattered all over the wiki and now we, uh, it's, it's much, much easier to, to find what, what, what you're looking for. Yeah. Another thing were, were the, 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 the Motu videos. You, you already mentioned them. I was pretty surprised about how, how, uh, how happy people were with, with those videos. I usually prefer real documentation you can search through it you can google for it it's 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 much easier but um people really like those recipe style documentation where you have step one to step ten and you you get something done at, at, at the end of it yeah and um there's something to be said for that for that um that human interaction when i i sat next to you and jono at uds one of them and you did a little packaging jam and you talked us through and i i had learned more from that than by reading a wiki page because you went through and explained what each step was and you know we could ask you questions you know like a training session really yeah that, that's also something i i tried to get uh, local peop uh, local teams to do that's uh, jams the bug so in packaging the jams packaging jams bug jams where people meet locally and you have a few folks you, you can ask them questions and, and as a team you try to get something done together right um, that was one of the experiences i i made very very early when i still lived in 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 dortmund michel folks mvo he lived very close by it was just great to meet him and to bug him with with all the questions and he explained <laughs> it and suddenly it all made sense i guess that, I would, that that makes it easier if you can if you can do that but obviously there are loads of people out there who don't live down the road from MVO or the right, Hullback right, right. or that's, whoever. That's something I, I, I want to work on in the, in the next cycle. I, I want to have a bit more documentation or prepare something like a, a jam kit 
something you can just download or burn on, onto a CD and you have all the documentation, all the stuff you need to, to get a packaging gem rolling. More videos. You need more videos. Yeah. Sure, if you, if you have suggestions, I'm, I'm totally up for it. Cool. Okay, uh, so Daniel, if someone wants to, um, who, who's never been involved with the actual development of Ubuntu, perhaps they've done a little bit of charging and working on Launchpad for, for, for the actual doing things, but if they want, actually want to get involved with the actual packaging, either packaging from scratch or, or working on fixing previous packages, where would you recommend they get started? I think the, the, the best starting point is um, if you had to wiki.ubuntu.com slash motu slash getting started, because all the all the relevant links, everything is, is linked from there, like the packaging guide, um, how Ubuntu development, how it all works, everything's explained there, like the release cycle, when we do what, and how merging works, and all the rest of it, the, the packaging videos, and also links to easy tasks you can get started with. And that's also something I, I want to improve some more in the next cycle. We, we need, a, I think... We're in a much better shape nowadays, but, but still we don't have the perfect answer for okay. what do I do. Okay, something else you've been working on is Harvest. Um, yep. now, now, can you just explain a bit what that is exactly? One thing I was really, really, really annoyed with was we have millions of lists of things that need doing. For example, when we build CDs, we have a list of packages that are not installable yet or um, something. Sometimes there's a library transition going on. There's still 10 packages that need to transition somehow. Some, something needs to be done with those packages to make them work with this or that library. Or we have outstanding merges. We have patches that need review. We have bugs that are fixed upstream, and we, we need to make sure we, we have the patch included and so on. So we have millions of lists, and lots of them don't live in, in Launchpad. But they live in people Ubuntu come slash something. And um, for people who, who just joined the project, it's very, very hard to find out where they are, what the purpose of them is, and, and what, what needs doing there. What I did with, with Harvest, Harvest was just have a few web pages that try to, to, to list all of those. I call them opportunities because <laughs> lots of them are just um, low-hanging fruit. That well, was, stuff, was the, the concept behind Harvest. But stuff that people could get into very quickly and easily. Yeah, yeah. Right. One, uh, one way that it may, uh, may make it easier, Daniel, actually, and something I've just thought of, is, um, is some way of um, enabling those who are experienced in packaging to mentor people that are just starting out. Um, you know, once you've realised that you actually have a desire rather than uh, thinking, oh, that'd be really cool. If you actually want to get into it, then a place to find a mentor who's willing to guide one, two, maybe three people through the packaging process or the bug process in some way. I don't know how you do that, but, um, you know, that'd be quite useful if you could actually, you know, chat to them on some live um, system to actually guide them through remotely how um, how they're doing and, and what they're doing wrong or, or how they're actually progressing quite well. Yeah, definitely. Um, so so the, the motor team always was, kind of that on-ramp to, to development. So it's perfectly fine if you, if you join the uh, hash ubuntu dash motu channel on IRC, on Freenode, if you join that and just ask whatever question you have there. Nobody's going to laugh about you. People are really friendly and, and helpful there. But I realize that some folks, they, they never joined I, IRC. They've never been on, on any ma kind of mailing list and, and so on. For, for them, it's a bit more, more difficult. I, it's I quite daunting, that. you know. It's, it's a big bunch of um, really experienced people that you need to sort of jump in and say, I have no idea what I'm doing. Help. And that's quite a big step for people who are inexperienced to take. Exactly. I still remember like four or five years ago when I was talking to, to Mark Shuttleworth, he compared it with people riding a bicycle on the on-ramp to a highway, because that, that's what it feels like. Because there's mm. all these highly technical discussions going on, and um, it doesn't make much, much sense to you. So we have a Motu mentoring uh, project. Um, it's, it's also on the wiki if you... It's uh, slash Motu slash mentoring. We have people who help you get, get started with it. The problem is you always need, need to, to wait a bit for a mentor, because there's just so many people who, who, who want to, to get involved. 
it's sometimes a bit difficult, so you might might uh, might need to have some patience. I have to say that um, I I did a little bit of packaging a couple of weeks ago, and I was I got so much help from Daniel and from James Westby, who I considered were mentoring me. I was just bugging them with questions, sure. and um, they both helped me, you know, so much and and reviewed my package and kept telling me when I was going wrong, and and that that's exactly what what I needed was someone to say no, you've done that wrong, or the convention is to do this or right. something like that, and it works brilliantly. It's really good. And the other thing we have is the, the sponsoring process. Um, that's, for us, it's, it's the, the main way to get um, a package reviewed and it's an excellent way to, to educate people because there you learn um, but not only from one mentor but from, from lots of people how people tend to... Sometimes it's just easy things. Uh, it's how do you explain what you did in, in the change log? For example, right. you need to document your changes and so on. So the the sponsoring process is um, when you're not part of of the the Ubuntu developers team yet, um, that people review your patches for you. Afterwards, they sign the package with their GP, G key and, and upload it to the to the build demons. So that's that's also a, a good way to to get feedback on yeah. whatever patch you have or new package. Okay, Daniel. One last question. Um, do you have to be a rocket scientist to be able to package for Ubuntu? Not at all. <laughs> that's, a, that's a question I get. I get it all the time, and and, and um, there's this misconception that you that a lot of people think you you need to speak C or C plus plus or or Perl or Python fluently just to be able to to help out with 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 packaging. In a lot of cases, it's it's about it's about detective skills. Mm. Sometimes you, you need to find out was this fixed somewhere else already. I need to apply this patch. Of course, you need to learn a, f a few tools and, and conventions. But if you have an, a knack for making things work again, or um, if you're careful about things, if you if you're not afraid of reading a bit of documentation, you can you can definitely help out. And that's the way I got involved. I didn't speak C fluently either, but somehow it it just worked out for me. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay. Well, thank you for talking to us this evening, and um, we'll hope to see some of your uh, increasing work in the in the Motu community and in development of the Motu community um, through the next release cycle. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Cheers, Thanks, Daniel. Daniel. Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Alan's not here. We've got an opportunity to rename this segment from Ubuntu Ecosphere to something else. Stuff. Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, what's in the Gerald this week? <laughs> Um, first up, Oxford Archaeology have blogged about why they chose canonical support for Ubuntu and their experiences with it, positive and negative. This is quite an interesting article, I think, um, talking about, uh, well, essentially the commercial support they've got from canonical. But um, you all look quite blank at me. <laughs> I, I saw the blog post and I've saved it on my to-do list to read that one. Right, so okay. I can't really comment on the actual content, but it's interesting that because clearly you have read it, mm. uh, it's interesting that, uh, that I did wonder whether it'd just be positive stuff on there. But the fact that there, there is some negative, I'm actually intrigued to read what the negative stuff is. Well, he talks about the uh, concerns about if uh, the canonical people can't fix an issue, have they really got the power to get the issue fixed in the upstream within a certain time frame? And that's one of the concerns I think he's got. Um, but it's interesting to see you know proper companies using this support and, and telling people that they've used the support. And that it's available. It's good. It, it does seem canonical seem to be putting more effort into um, actually having more people on the ground to actually to, to actually help with setup and things like. I that. I think they're always sort of expanding their teams, aren't they? I certainly, seen adverts on the job on the website, on Canonical Jobs website. That you know, they're always looking to recruit new people. It's interesting that job that uh, Tony subscribes to that page. I don't subscribe to it. Jerome S. Katango has blogged about the future of the Edge Ubuntu project, saying it needs to reconsider its direction in the light of the popularity of netbooks. Yeah, because at the moment it's, it's all around LTSP. That's the big difference between um, Edge Ubuntu and, say, Ubuntu. There's a few educational apps in there, and it's got the whole LTSP, the thin, thin client terminal server, set up out of the box. But schools aren't using those anymore. They're all using netbooks. Mm. Are, are, are they? Well, yeah. You know, the, the, the cheapness of netbooks means that you know schools are actually buying them and giving them to their students. Maybe not in in some areas of the world, but increasingly in the UK, you see projects where people are giving all of their your students a netbook. Well, 100, 150 quid, you buy 
enough of them, you get the price down low, you give them a netbook. So, uh, you know, you're using netbook remix rather than a thin thin client terminal server thing. Yeah, good point. So where should Edubuntu be putting their focus? I, it's probably not in the network side of things anymore. It should all be about apps and the usability and, the, and, the, and polishing the educational apps, I think. The thing is with LTSP is it is really awesome. And it's a shame it's not used. You know, I would, I would love to get my teeth into actually doing a serious project with that. Maybe the network side of it should be more on connecting the laptops together seamlessly um, than on the type, thin client type of network. Well, like mesh to. networking. Because mm. that's the other thing, of course. You've got the whole one laptop per child has happened in the last couple of years. And that that's what brought about the interest in netbooks in the first place. Mm. If only there was a way of sharing files easily between multiple computers where you <laughs> just have a folder inside your inside your home directory and you just drop files in there. So perhaps like a, a teacher. box that you could drop things into. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. I mean, you don't need one of these. If one you, service you call, on yeah, an Ubuntu system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You could call it Ubuntu One. Could they? Yeah. Anyway, Simon... All right, Scott Ritchie has been working on the security dialog boxes for Wine applications. Yeah, that's a bit weird. Um, it, it, he's sort of talking about how you... And when when you start on XE, double-click an XE on Ubuntu, should it start up under, under Wine? And should you know that you're double-clicking an XE and that you're trying to give an application permissions to run? Because one of the things with Vista now is that every time you run an application, you get 18 dialog boxes telling you that such and such an application is trying to run. Huh. Um Whereas on Unix, you usually use permissions on the file system sure. to say what's executable and what's not. Well, Wine doesn't understand that, and Java doesn't understand those semantics. So now you could have a Java file or an executable file that might just run, and it might not be a good one to just run. Well, I actually installed a vi- I intentionally did this just to see how it worked, but I actually intentionally installed a virus, a Windows virus, under Wine. And it actually it worked. You know, it was it was compatible with Wine. So perhaps that should go on Wine <laughs> HQ as as a compatible application. You get gold compatibility yeah. with yeah. Slammer it or did, whatever did it was. Work. Um, so, so when yeah. you say it worked, what did it do? Um, I can't. To be honest, I can't remember what virus it was. This was you didn't get the email. Years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 with the, yeah, with the, with the back door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, no, it, 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 I, I can't remember what one it was. I think it was a Trojan, but it, it did work. Um, now it's an interesting one because it didn't actually ask. I, I didn't need sudo or root access or even to put, type in a password. I just it just installed it. It just worked um, because you know with with Wine you actually have your like your equivalent to C. You have your C drive mm. actually inside your home directory. Yeah. Mm. Um, so there's no need for you to have root access, um, which which is an interesting concept. Um, so yeah, I would actually lo- like to see. You know, do you want to run this under Wine? with the option of potentially disabling it. But yeah, because there's not a security there. But on the other hand, should you also have it so it's seamless? And if you're having to, to you know, press OK on dialogues, things like that, you're losing the seamless stuff. Yeah, and I think that's what Scott's getting at. If you look at the sort of the wording, he's got a big whiteboard where he's drawn up um, sort of iterations of this dialogue box over and over again saying, you know, do you just want to run this program or do you want to cancel? Or should there be a properties button where you can say, I don't want to see these notes, I just want to run the program in future interesting that that's something you see on internet explorer isn't it when you download an application yeah and it says do you want to run this or always run this so so yeah maybe it's just a side effect of having to deal with windows programs on on linux (laughs) yeah (laughs) and the last thing we've got in the gerald this week is um (laughs) an advanced copy of ubuntu user uh, a new magazine that, that dave has stolen from the presses somewhere i was given a chunk of them Really? Okay. Now, Hop the Press is episode one, which is a pilot um, pilot one. Okay, and so it's a, it's a glossy magazine, similar to some of the other Linux magazines you may see on the uh, newsstands. We think it's been put together by the people uh, behind Linux magazine, um, doing all the sort of typesetting, things like that. But it's got columns from um, community manager John O'Bacon, and uh, we can see Mike... Basinger, who we interviewed back in season one, who's the forums guy. And he's also the answer guy. He is the well. answer so man. You can write him with, with a problem, and uh, good old Mike will help you answer Yeah, he is Any one problem? Of the, uh, pretty much. Well, any problem Ubuntu related. I don't suppose he does um, social disorders, but um, <laughs> he might do. Um, but he is one of the nicest guys in Ubuntu. So. There, there's an interesting article about rolling your own Debian packages using various ways. Yeah, so where's this pitch then, do we think? New I users? Think yeah, I think it is. They're covering things, certainly in this issue, like uh, UFW Firewall, um, building a website, um, Answer Man, of course, you just mentioned. There's a gaming article. 
Which is actually quite interesting because mm. a lot of people don't know about what games you can run under Ubuntu. They talk about flight gear and Lin City and. But that role in your own thing doesn't sound very novicey. Virtualization well, as well. There's a feature on virtualization. Yeah. So maybe they're just, I don't know, up and coming, getting See, into it. I mean, perhaps they've missed the trick here when it actually tells you how to install Ubuntu. I, I would imagine the actual uh, people that buy this magazine probably do have a working installation of Ubuntu. Well, and to actually tell them well, how to install it? I, well, maybe not. I mean, if this is the first one, it's Ubuntu user, the disk in there, and they're actually telling you how to well, install yeah. it. So. I mean, I, I, I could potentially buy a Mac one if I thought about buying a MacBook to tell me about how to use a Mac. Yeah. So, so, yeah. The difference okay. is you're not going to get a copy of Mac OS X included on the DVD <laughs> in the magazine. <laughs> Here it's got uh, jaunty 32 and 64 bit versions in a double sided DVD. Which, you know, if you've been banging on at your friends and family about Ubuntu and they see this in the shelves and Tesco's or something, they might just grab it and give it a go. Yep. At seven ninety nine a quarter. Which is... Yeah, not yeah, too yeah bad. so, so too it bad. comes every three months. I won't be buying the first one, of course, because I just got a yeah, copy. Yeah, we just got a copy but of I will, it. I'll, I'll look for it. Yeah. I want to see what Mike says next time. <laughs> going to write into him with my social problems. <laughs> and that's all from the Gerald this week. <laughs> In the last episode, we set a competition where people could come up with their suggestions for Ubuntu 1 and uh, in return they would get an invite to the beta service. We had 10 invites, I think, to give away. We had 10, ten invites. Yeah. So we have 10 winners. Okay, Excellent. and uh, Laura, you've got the list of names, is it right? I have, and we've got some of the things that were suggested. Okay. Um, my favourite, I think, was Michael G. Fletcher saying he'd like to create an installation profile that so that when he's installing a vanilla Ubuntu, he can log into his Ubuntu One account and it can control Synaptic to install all the additional packages based on his profile, which kind of ties in with what we said talked about last season in terms of what you do, you do after you've installed and how it'd be nice to be able to run something that installed everything you wanted. Ooh, I quite like that. That's a good idea. See, mm. see that's almost like a, like a virtual desktop thing, isn't it? Like hot desking, but with your own... Mm. Yeah, yeah, okay. But okay. you could extend that to settings as well, so that all your preferences... Yep. Like I, I focus follows mouse on my desktop, but that's not the default setting, so all of that sort of stuff could follow you around as well. Yep. Well, you say but, that. Hang, hang on, hang on, back up, back up. Focus, <laughs> focus follows, follows mouse. mouse. Yes. Why would you do that? What do you use a mouse for? Come on. <laughs> all right, I've got two grumpy old men with me in the room here. <laughs> one of them, you, one of them who doesn't like focus the... follows mouse, and one of them who doesn't like mice. That's one of the most annoying <laughs> things ever. Well, okay. Tony um, likes it. Really? I like it, you know. Um, let's not go into what's annoying. If you're disappointed by Tony, please get in touch with us by Identico or the Twitter network. Yeah. Um, so Liam Greenhues said an option to act as a network connected drive so you can just ma- you can just mount the Ubuntu one share as a network drive and use it directly. Um, so for instance, current services like Drop- Dropbox, you need to synchronise all the files to a local drive. So if you've got a two gig account, you've also got to have two gig local storage. Yeah, but the thing is, they've said with Ubuntu One, it will always do that to stop you being locked into the account, to well, being locked into the service. You say that, but um, I just put um, Jaunty on my um, EPC, and it's the first time I've actually done a proper install. Previously, I've only been using the web app, and um, actually, you don't automatically sync if you use the web app. So it's really cool. In fact, I'm probably going to install Ubuntu One on this and just use the web service, because then you can control what you download. Sorry, you, so you mean you do it via the web panel yep. rather than using the little applet? Yeah, I like that. I don't want to sync everything. I want it all out there well, and yeah. I can grab it when I want to grab it. Because if you share one of your shares with me and then drop a, say, 250 meg file in there... then Like it's... you do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys. So, yeah, most of the other suggestions were similar to what Tony said, actually, to do with um, settings or bookmarks in a delicious style. And a couple right. said about syncing their... Ubuntu UK podcast episodes so they can listen to them anywhere and forever. <laughs> That's just creepy. Yeah. I'm going to make a hypothesis on what I suspect Ubuntu One's going to do, you know. Go on. Let's all listen to the wisdom of Dave. See, now we'll, we'll find out after OzCon, yeah. But I'm expecting it to be a, um, a similar to Google App Engine where you can make your site and then drop it into a folder and it's on the internet. It, on the internet. <laughs> the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's on the internet. That's what I, I think that's one of the things it's going to okay. do. I think it's going to make easy to actually make very functional, uh, content-driven websites, I think. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll see if you're right in due course. Yep. So, yeah. So, we've got 10 uh, winners. 
Who are uh, they? Who they are, in chronological order that they entered the competition, I think. <laughs> uh, Jason Miller, Liam, Gre- Liam Green Hughes, Hamish, Andrew, Joe Maxwell, Sam Patsu- Patuzzi, Jason Hug, Warren, Michael G. Fletcher, and Charles Yarnold. Well done. Congratulations, everybody. Well, and we've got a new competition to set this time round. Oh, it's a good one, isn't it? It is a very good one. Nice. You don't get competitions like this every week. <laughs> Um, or, or, on any other, week. or on or any, any other, other podcast. Or any, well, no, indeed. We believe. That we know of. <laughs> <laughs> um, the prize is a fantastic one, which is free entrance to the three talk days. That's Tuesday the 30th of June to Thursday the 2nd of June. July. Um, July. July, sorry. At Europython 2009 in Birmingham. But not only that, it also includes two nights accommodation. Cool. Awesome prize. It is a fantastic prize. So we need to thank the guys at Europython... 2009 for donating it to us thanks chaps and the, they have set the question as well they have set this themselves so it's a bit of a tough one tougher than perhaps normal and uh laura what's the question which speaker is so relaxed about his database that he has a rest the answer requires a bit of digging and it's not on the home page yes but it is somewhere apparently on the europython.eu website so email your answer to competition at ubuntu-uk.org by sunday the 7th of june and you have to be able to get yourself to Birmingham and cover costs of meals and so on. So basically you get your accommodation and that's it. And the entrance. So the obviously entrance. this is yes. open to anyone in the world providing they can get themselves to Birmingham. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, the other thing is if you're not interested in Python, then perhaps this isn't the best place for you. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Maybe you just like staying in hotels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With geeks. Yeah. 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 But um, but no, I mean it's uh, it, it, it's from what I understand, it's going to be a, quite an interesting thing. It's it's going to be a lot of talks. It's not just sat around talk, talking. It's going to be a lot of presentations and talks. I mean, I know uh, there's something like over a hundred speakers at the, over the over the couple of days. Yeah, well, cool. it's three days worth of talks. So there's going to be a lot of people and a lot of different stuff to hear about. Yeah, so from from beginner level right up to to sort of my level. Can I enter? I, I, I don't Spain know. Not. Okay, can, can we can we let Simon enter? <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I, I Simon, wouldn't. all you have to do is enter under a false name. No, right? don't worry. Well, that's what you should say. Good luck, everybody. Yeah, Good absolutely. luck. Ready for the feedback? Yeah. Now, actually, our feedback could probably be a separate annex episode on its own for this one, I think. <laughs> yeah, we could release it uh, on iTunes only for the uh, MP3 listeners. <laughs> we'll be talking about <laughs> Firefox add-ons, eh? Bonus content. <laughs> yeah, who'd have thought Firefox extensions were so interesting? <laughs> <laughs> no, we do welcome all your feedback, obviously. <laughs> Right, shall I start? Yeah, yeah thanks, David. Okay, Richard Querin uh, said, <clears throat> whilst this isn't an add-on per se, Firefox's add a keyword for this search feature is tremendously useful. Right, I'll try and explain this. Uh, it took me a couple of times to understand it. In Firefox, when you go to a page with a search box, you use often, like uh, Google, Wikipedia, or IMDb, um, right-click on the box and choose add a keyword for this search. You store this as a bookmark, um, but you give it a name and a short keyword. So any time later, instead of heading over to Wikipedia, for example, you can just type the keyword and then your search terms into the address bar, and then there you go. You're taken to the search results on the site um, that you chose. Okay, so if I want to set up a keyword for Google, I can call it G. G. Yep. So I can put in the address bar G. Ubuntu oh. UK podcast, enter, and it takes me to those results. See, I thought this was like reinventing the actual one we have already in the right-hand side yeah. of Firefox. It, it is a bit. It is a bit, but it's possibly Maybe slightly it's for quicker. people who don't like using a mouse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good idea. That's why we've got Simon to read that one. Hey. Oh, he's got a PS on there as well, actually. Okay. Yeah, the PS is, I'm surprised I didn't hear Ack give uh, a shot back when the security of his coding was questioned in the recent Ubuntu One interview. Maybe he had a few uh, choice words that were edited out. Uh, no. No, he didn't. He missed that one, although I'm expecting a kicking next time I see him in person, I suspect. Yeah, he, he was in professional mode. Ah, I didn't know he had one. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, isn't That's it? That's another kicking. <laughs> yeah, I'm storing them up. <laughs> Sorry, I'll run away. That'll, that'll sort him out. Um, David King has written in to tell us about McAfee Site Advisor, which I've not heard of before no, this, but we had two or three people wrote in to say about this, I think. Um, mm. He used to work with Fine in Firefox 2, but then he upgraded to Firefox 3 and it stopped working. Um, and then he discovered Swiftfox, which is a clone of Firefox, which claims to be the same but faster. 
Um, and basically, I started to work with him, work with uh, that afterwards. Um, but McAfee Sitevisor apparently gives you a, uh, this may be a spamming site or that sort of thing um, when you go to a particular website. So it's a bit like the phishing filter, I guess, built into IE8. Mm. But it's interesting that a big company like McAfee is bothering to put out extensions for mm. Firefox. Dave, you're mmming at me. Well, I'm not sure I have that much respect for uh, McAfee products, to be honest. From what I've read on a recent blog post, I understand they don't even use their own tools internally. Really? You know, so I, I, I don't know. Well, they're not free either. Who wrote the blog well, post, though? Well, yeah, this is true. This is true. I, I, I should have. I should cite references, but instead I'm just going to throw some fud out there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Zoke, I, I assume it's Zoke, Exoke uh, via Identica said Firefox extension Scrapbook allows you to save pages, organize and annotate them if you want. Oh, uh, yeah, that, you were asking about that. I was that, asking about you? that. Yeah. I, I did a direct shout out to our audience there. And, and they responded. Yeah, yeah, just, just a fortnight later. <laughs> <laughs> Christoph Vilchinski emailed in a big list of his favorite fi- Firefox extensions, including Customize Google, Undo Closed Tabs, and Fission, which gives Safari-style progress bars. Now, I don't he's know a top chap, he is. Undo closed tabs sounds like the sort of thing that you install the minute after you've accidentally it closed, closed the tab. tab. It's like underly, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the sort of thing that should be in Firefox itself. That e? sounds like a really useful but low-profile extension. For when you go control w happy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, the customised Google thing's a bit weird. It allows you to put links to the same search results for Yahoo and things within your Google pages. So I guess, I don't know how it works under the, under the covers. It must be a bit like a grease monkey script. It inserts extra stuff onto the Google page. Fission? Oh, the Safari style progress bars. Yeah. What's yeah. Safari style? So when you're downloading something, it, it, the, pro, the address bar goes blue and you see the progress as you're going along downloading your thing along the address bar so it see, increases uh, right. the, when, the way you explained that i was actually going to be larting you with what you were saying they're going oh wow that sounds amazing but actually i can actually find a use for that you see it's yeah. not just eye candy my friend what instead of having a pop-up downloads box uh, i don't I know whether it's instead of, it compliments yeah. it. that would be good yeah I'd, that download box annoys me <laughs> <laughs> just get that out right uh, jack um washington landfill yeah, it's his online. Oh, okay, all right. And uh, Roger Light uh, both emailed in to recommend Zotero, Z O T E R O, for taking snapshots of web pages. Uh, Jack wrote, uh, Zotero is a uh, production of the Centre for History and New Media at George Madison University. Uh, not only can you grab the pages, but if you are doing any sort of academic paper, you can automatically create a bibliography. Cool. Um, it can also capture from within PDFs, uh, Word and OpenOffice documents and sync your library to a remote location. Sounds pretty powerful. Creating a bibliography is handy. So it's another way of doing what you were asking, Dave, about archiving pages. But this yeah, is archiving I think, plus, plus, plus. I think it? he did mention it in his email, but I think he said it possibly bloat, didn't he? Which for, for my use case, it probably is. But the bibliography thing, that actually sounds really mm, useful. useful. Uh, Sean Hills, a.k.a. Hillsy, has written in saying it's a good show and it's much better in the new unprofessional format yeah, than thanks. the season one format. <laughs> I can't think what he means. Um, on the subject of Firefox extensions, he says he uses the delicious toolbar extension to manage all his bookmarks across all of his machines. And the Mozilla archive format extension is a great way to save web pages for later referrals. That's another one answering your question, Dave. Um, it has the bonus of being able to work with MHT files from certain other evil proprietary browsers. Yeah, you asked yeah, about MHT had, files a while ago, weren't yeah, you? I had an issue with one. Somebody emailed me. <laughs> I went off on one about freedom. <laughs> oh, dear. There you go. Did you then find out that you could open it anyway? No, you not can't. natively. Not, not, it's not like native. a bug that's you... about 10 years old or something, oh, right. isn't it? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. And he also says Google Gear is meh. Enough said. Mm-hmm. And now on to other matters. Oh, that sounds uh, tantalising. Uh, Paul J. Uh, Kirk Kernast, um, with all the talk about bookmarks and Google, you missed one powerful tool. The way I handle my bookmarks is to use Google Bookmarks. Nothing to install in the browser, and you've got easily categorised bookmarks anywhere you are. You can drag a little JavaScript button onto your toolbar to be able to add a bookmark to Google Bookmarks. And I usually have one bookmark on my browser toolbar to Google Bookmarks itself as well. That sounds a bit of a tongue twister, to be honest. <laughs> it's a bit recursive, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Maybe he needs a Google bookmark to go to his bookmarks page to get the bookmark for Google yeah, Bookmarks. Yeah, so he has one real bookmark in his browser that leads to Google Bookmarks, which is obviously an online hosted service for keeping your bookmarks. Yes. Okay, okay. He, says, he goes on to say, I have hundreds of bookmarks categorised in my Google Bookmarks. 
It's great. Admittedly, I find myself adding bookmarks much more than re retrieving them. Yep. Perhaps a 10 to 1 ratio, but nevertheless, it's pure gold. I guess if you've got an easy way of restoring them and searching through them, then you might as well just bookmark something just in case. That's what I do with Delicious. Hmm. See, I want to use Delicious, but I'm actually the reason I'm not using it is because it's a non-free service. But also, I can't understand if I add something to my Delicious bookmarks, are they immediately available for you or anyone else to look at? Yeah, unless you check the box that says private. Oh, I didn't know you could do that because yeah. when I'm working on different things, I tend to use things like Tomboy to get my bookmarks and stuff. And Delicious would actually be really good for me. Yeah, that is good. Okay. Ian Pascoe says, <laughs> "Can you please arrange yourselves better around the microphone?" In places in episode three, I had to crank up the volume to hear what was being said by whomever was furthest away from the mic at that particular moment. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he says, excluding Laura. And I don't think that's because I've got good mic technique. I think that's because I didn't have a microphone. Yeah. Um, it's when you shout, shout from off microphone and you go, hello. Hiya. That's the one. And then drop it. And then he has to drop the volume again quickly afterwards. Not a problem as long as I remember I've yanked the volume up, but it is a tad difficult when you're having one of your lively debates and I have to miss some of the commentary unless I've plugged my headphones in. I think he's emailed the wrong podcast when he I, says lively debates. I, <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know. I think he's talking about you, Dave. I don't know. <laughs> See, I'm <laughs> always very loud. Everyone knows that. Absolutely. This is the first time in the it episode you've talked into, the into your mic. Yeah. Loud in the wrong direction. We have thought about getting a nail gun and laying <laughs> his microphone to his face. The week I've had, I think I appreciate that. <laughs> He says, is Alan the one holding the mic, as he always seems to be the one who doesn't disappear into the background? Oh, or does he always sit where the packet of biscuits lay, being conveniently located next to the mic? Couldn't possibly comment. Couldn't comment. Well, Alan's not here to defend himself. And there's no biscuits this week either. Is that a there was chocolate cake. Shh. We actually have a mic each, though. Um, we, yeah. So everybody's responsible for their own technique. If they don't talk into the microphone, it's their own incompetence. Tony, it's my go on the mic now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm talking now, Dave. Right, Josh Holland uh, has written and said, while I find it commendable that the uh, mirrors are finally published after many weeks of nagging, what is not so impressive is the complete lack of my actual name on the list. I would expect you to remember me, especially after a long IRC session. Uh, Davey and I spent fixing up my virtual hosts so that you could access both my blog and the mirror. And also that somehow the setup to uh, SSH into the server was forgotten between seasons. But no, always destined to be forgotten. It's a hard life running a mirror. Who is that from? Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you ran into that one. Yeah. Yeah, we had his IRC Sorry, nickname, Josh. but we didn't actually have his, his real name on the mirror list. But it's now on it's there fixed now. now it's Give it? you a yes. simple job to do. It's Josh Holland. <laughs> yes, well done, Josh. Yeah, thanks, Josh. Josh Holland. Josh, Josh. Josh. you Josh are Holland. my hero, Josh. Yeah, Dashi. Josh. Davy King has written in saying um, that he has bought an Asus EPC 901 with Linux a few weeks ago, complete with Xandros. Uh, although it was quite hard to find, he's very happy with it and can run Ubuntu Netbook Remix from a flash drive. He wouldn't want to get win one with Windows XP, though. It's a shame that Asus sells them with XP, as XP is pretty rubbish compared with to Linux. Well, yes, uh, it is. Well done. That's what we were talking about before. It hasn't yeah, XP yeah. actually dropped its uh, service now. I mean, it's no... Yeah. I don't, you know what? I don't think it's it It's supported for just netbooks, as far as I'm aware. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, and critical security stuff. But because nobody's going to Vista, uh, Microsoft have had to keep doing stuff for XP until Windows 7 comes out. Oh, Matthew Stow has taken us very literally and writes in. Last episode, you had two questions. One, is there another Ubuntu podcast? Two, does anyone know someone who runs Fedora? As for question one, if you go to www.tlts, which is, I believe, the Linux, the Linux link texture. Yeah, yeah. And look at the list of podcasts they have there. You'll see several podcasts listed with Ubuntu in the name, such as yourselves, the Ubuntu podcast, and the fresh <coughs> Ubuntu podcast. So the what? Such the as the Ubuntu <coughs> podcast. <laughs> what, I, I didn't hear those. <laughs> <laughs> For the second question, I am a member of the Columbia, Columbia area LUG, uh, calug.org. Of the 30 to 40 regular attendees of CA Lug, about 18 of us, including myself, run a Ubuntu variant. There are two that run Slackware, six that run Debian, and at least nine that run Fedora and or Red Hat CentOS. At least one runs Crunchbang. 
and I am not sure what else they run. As for the number of Ubuntu users, <laughs> I can tell you that I have only downloaded each version of one of the Ubuntu versions once, but my wife uses Ubuntu on her laptop, and I use it on both my server, my PC, and my Myth TV box. My six-year-old uses it on both our systems to run g Compris, Potato Guy, and Super Tux Racer. Super Tux. Cool. Cool. Games, aren't they? Yeah. Yep. And I have burned a copy of my father-in-law, my brother-in-law, <laughs> for his for father, his father. <laughs> auntie's sister's brother's uncle's son. <laughs> a lot um, of his relatives. And, and also some friends. Also, as you can see from examples on the Ubuntu 904 CD, all Howard County Public Libraries use Ubuntu on their computer systems. Also, I run all four of our machines behind a router firewall, so Canonical can only see one IP address when I download anything from them. If these numbers have any kind of indication, then you are probably correct in assuming that there are at least 26 drum roll, million, 26 million uh, Ubuntu users worldwide. But that, that's based on science compared to our, our previous yes. estimation. <laughs> He's done a survey of geeks and found out that some of them use Linux. <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you very much for your email. He knows nine people Matthew. that run Fedora. Yeah. We could only come up with two between four so that, of us. That means that there's 11 worldwide. <laughs> at least <laughs> do you think anybody who uses Fedora actually listens to this podcast no, nobody's emailed in to say they have no I know Fedora listener that has listened to the podcast you're keeping that very close to yourself there so anyway Wayne H says great podcast people informative and entertaining I'm one of those who fully support Ubuntu 1. Unfortunately, I'm using Ubuntu 8.04, so I can't beta test it, but I'm looking forward to it being released and for more services being provided. I currently use Dropbox, which is fast and has worked flawlessly. Well, thanks, Wayne, for your email there, but how can you fully support something if you haven't tried it? Fully supports it in principle. And the idea of it. Yeah. And presumably he doesn't mind about the whole trademark thing. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Floyd's written in. He says, here in Oz, Adele has just announced netbooks powered with Ubuntu, uh, which is uh, good news. They've just um, launched the 10V, haven't they? With, um, yes. Because in the previous episode, didn't we have an email where we said someone had emailed in from Australia saying, yeah. saying they couldn't get one? You couldn't you get a netbook get with Ubuntu get, on in Australia. So now they, they've actually now said you, you get Adele. You oh. have to go and buy Dell. Do you reckon our podcast has directly influenced that? Yes. Yeah, I think Dell Marketing probably listened to us all the time. Yeah. yeah. Jason Hug has written in to say that in our last podcast we were asking for any other Ubuntu podcasts. Well, yes, he says, and links to... Uh, <laughs> can't quite read that, actually. <laughs> no. But he, he does say... He does say that our show is much better and funnier. Oh, so, so that was the Ubuntu podcast one, was it? <laughs> yeah, that was Ubuntu podcast, and he said we were much better and funnier. Better okay. and funnier. Okay. Than okay. any other... Than Potentially, well, potentially existing yeah, Ubuntu podcasts. Yeah, that's quite good. Thanks, Jason. Mike Purcell emailed to tell us that the results of our survey from the GNOME Usability Project, which has an interesting breakdown of distro usage between respondents. Fedora, 159. Ubuntu, 742. Wow. Or a ratio of 4.667. Someone did their maths there. Yeah. Rather, I wonder if he did that in his head. <laughs> Rather higher than the 1.6 suggested in the podcast. Ubuntu also made up just over 50% of all collected answers. You could read that two ways. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. However, one reason I'd be careful about... Ex- Extrapolating. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Uh, f- from these numbers is something you didn't mention in the podcast, if I remember correctly. Lots of Fedora users are corporate users where there's a big install base. Uh, yeah, yeah. So behind the firewall, behind the gateway. Do we think that's correct? I mean, maybe Red, Red Hat, Hat Enterprise maybe. Linux or Word, Red Hat Workstation or whatever it is. Well, okay. I think, I think if we, if we take the gist of what he's saying, he's mm. saying that it's not Ubuntu. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll go along with that. Interesting numbers. Anyway, and if we accept that the 14 million number of Fedora uh, users, which we, which we probably don't, then we have around 65.3 million Ubuntu users. Too small, surely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is very, very finger in the air yeah. type mathematics, yeah. isn't it? So well, I think, I mean, yeah. it's the best kind. I mean, Einstein didn't get where he did just by, you know, quoting, you know, numbers he could sustain and back up. Absolutely. And he could have told us exactly how many Ubuntu users there are. Calculated it from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And holding the moss up in the, in the air and letting go. Yes. Hmm. Colin Hayes <laughs> <laughs> said... 
three things. First of all, with regards to a brief conversation in your last podcast about F1 being help and it being common and consistent, as in a lot of cases regarding standardisation, this particular definition leads back to IBM. It, amongst other keystrokes, was defined in IBM's common user access, CUA, definitions in their attempt to sort out how applications should function for users. See Wikipedia, um, common user access. The second thing was PGP and encryption in general, read Crypto by Stephen Levy. Brilliant book, given, giving the human side of the invention of computer cryptography and the history of how it happened. Oh, yes, because we were talking about everybody having to change their GPG keys because of the uh, SHA-1 vulnerability, yeah. weren't we? Actually, that yeah. does sound like a good bedtime read, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's need to sleep on right? <laughs> <laughs> Half a page a night. Um, and the third thing was, he's interested in what podcasts we listen to. Um, I listen to the Bunch UK podcast. Yes, well Every done. Every week. Every fortnight. Before we release it. Sometimes. I must admit, I don't really listen to other Linux podcasts anymore since Lug Radio stopped. Um, I, don't, I haven't really listened to them. I listen to lots of other ones from the BBC and, and um, the Reduced Shakespeare Company and Smodcast. I listen to a lot from Radio 4, actually. Yeah. Kill the breeze. <laughs> <laughs> I don't listen to ours, actually. I get so sick of it when I'm editing it. I, uh, I really don't enough. listen to it. But uh, mine are mainly um, running podcasts, actually. I, I, I This week I actually caught up with some British Computer Society ones. They've actually got about five different podcasts and they don't seem to be doing that regularly, but um, some of them seemed quite interesting. But to be fair, I, I do sometimes listen to uh, some of the ones, uh, Linux Outlaws, and uh, basically I don't download the, and listen to them when they come out. I basically come across them and I'll probably listen to a free software-related podcast every every third day in the week, I suppose. Um, I think Alan, Alan isn't here, but I suspect he could probably top anybody with the number of podcasts he listens to. And this is true. Crikey. Yeah, I, I mean, three he hours wanted to train every day, I suppose. Yeah, because yeah. he, he didn't want to go through his phone and type them all into. He actually wanted a script to actually convert all these long URLs for the RSS feeds into like tiny URL or a similar service. Um, so he could just type them into his phone rather than type <laughs> each of them in. So he got, he got uh, I gave him this script where... And he he must have had at least thirty or so podcasts, so he could put it straight into his phone. And I just thought, crikey, malikey, I was quite impressed. And he's actually got them all on his wiki. Actually, it's, it, yeah. there's quite a comprehensive list. Actually, and it's a mixture of stuff as well, isn't it? Yeah, some of it I'm not sure is compatible with. with um... Don't start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy, uh, Colin Hay. Sorry, back to Colin. Um, he listens to Tux Radar and the Linux Action Show although it's very, very American. Um, and that's in addition to our fine podcast. Oh, what about the Colonel podcast? By, uh, that by John sounds Masters. exciting. Yeah, yeah, it, it was actually strangely... <laughs> strangely... Interesting. Interesting. Uh, okay. Excellent. No, no, come on, don't be like that. <laughs> and there's a new one that's come from the same guys as the, the uh, Linux Action Show, Myth TV podcast. I'm not sure that's sustainable, and I'm going to have to give that a thumbs down. To be honest, I was a bit—I was a bit—I dis- mean, I didn't expect much, and I was a bit disappointed with that one. There we go. In your humble opinion, as a myth, myth Buntu guy, yeah, yeah, an expert. I, I, well, I'm just not sure that it's sustainable to have that fortnightly it's or, or too monthly. narrow a scope. You mean? Yeah, I mean, we were worried that ours might be too narrow, but it seems to be okay. Whereas that's even more narrow, and I just don't think development's that fast. Regarding the content or something. No, because you're spending your time recording this podcast <laughs> yeah. and not developing with Monty. We should fix some of those bugs. Yeah. Okay, so he says he ran Fedora on his Acer Aspire 1. So there we go. We know somebody he's written in That's who 12 now. runs Fedora. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the show. Keep them coming. They keep me entertained whilst walking my dog. Ben Fox says, uh, who is Flame Kebab? Nice one. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, I just wanted to drop you a quick email to let you know I'm really enjoying the second season. I listened to the odd episode here and there in the first series and um, was interested but not intrigued. Sorry about that. Um, by contrast, I've been looking forward to each new episode of season two. Uh, you're doing a great job and I feel you're starting to fill the void left by Lug Radio. Uh, so he likes the least. less professional bit. <laughs> yeah, <then>. that's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, other than that, I didn't have uh, much to say. I've uh, run various podcasts over the years and always enjoyed it when uh, someone took the time to uh, email in. And so I felt that I should. Uh, it was high time you received a pat on the back uh, from him. 
Uh, okay. Perhaps we'll see you at Lug Radio Live uh, 09 in October. Okay. Until then, keep up the good work. Pat on the back, everyone, to us. Yep. Well done. Yes, we'll probably be at Lug Radio Live. Yeah. I reckon. Yeah. <laughs> And I think that's the time for the end of the episode, chaps. Uh, so should we say goodbye? Um, so thanks for listening. And thanks to everyone who took part via the uh, Twitter and the Identica. If you'd like to get hold of us, you can email the show via podcast at ubuntu-uk.org or leave 30 seconds of voicemail on 0845 508 1986. You can send us your comments on Identica via identity.ca slash UUPC or Twitter, which is twitter.com slash UUPC, as well as getting updates from recording sessions. Alternatively, if you're into IRC, you can chat to us via the hash Ubuntu-UK channel on the Freenode IRC network. Find our fan page on Facebook, search for Ubuntu UK Podcast. We welcome suggestions, material, tips, tricks, reviews or rants and feedback, both positive and negative, so please do get in touch. I'm not welcoming any tricks, you know, it's, it's not <laughs> April Fool's yet, Tony. <laughs> thanks also to our network of community mirrors, including Josh Holland, oh, listed on the thanks, website. Josh yeah, no, big one, Josh, nice one. <laughs> All right, that's, that's it. it, we'll see you in two weeks. Bye. 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 Bye.